So welcome to the Choose 80 Zoom room. Um, first of all, it's really lovely to hear your voices. It's just so nostalgic and comforting to hear, hear those voices that we grew up with. Especially with the heritage charts. Um, how did that all come about, the heritage charts? Can you tell us a bit more about it? Yeah, it came about, I um, I was having a, sorry, I just bashed one of my teeth this morning, so I'm talking oh, in a strange way. My nice. voice is, it's not as comforting as it normally is. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, I was talking with some of the artists uh, who had uh, songs out that weren't getting a look in anywhere else. And, you know, and they said, we've got some of the best songs you've ever done out, and no one is actually taking any notice of them. Uh, so it's really born out of that, talking to the artists, and they said, well, you're playing it. Uh, you're playing our songs, but nobody else is. So it just oh. came out of that. And then the, the idea w was born from that. And I thought, well, you know, yeah, let, let's do it. It's a shop window for these artists. And they're not getting a shop window anywhere else. They're all still relevant. They're all still making great music. Um, and yet they're yeah. being frustrated, especially this year, which has been bad for live gigs anyway. Yeah. yeah. So, Bit so of God the, old, the old charts used, were based on record sales. How do you compile this one? It's, it's basically popularity chart, really. The, the listeners uh, on Facebook, uh, Twitter, social media generally, uh, the amount of plays on the station, you know, the other DJs and what have you. So uh, by and large, we've got it right. You know, you, you, you can tell from the listeners if they go, oh, why is that number one? Oh, I don't like that. Why? So, you know, we know, we know we've got it right. It's just a shop window for these artists, basically. All right. And of course, to a certain extent, we have two really important charts now. We've got a chart that is the official UK top 40, right here, right, and, and sort of that my kids would be interested yeah. in. But yeah. actually, for yeah. all of us, that you know, I'm 59, Mike's a bit older, you guys are probably obviously a lot younger, but you've grown up with charts, and you've Sunday afternoon, you count down the 40 songs, right? And yeah. so why should that change? And it's everything that Mike said is true, that there are these artists, you look at the 30 songs out there in the chart this week, some great artists that we have yeah. all grown up with that we kind of go, I know these guys, it's and they're making very, very good songs. I would say that Nick Kershaw record, for example, just to pick yeah. one, I think yeah. it probably has one of the best songs he's ever done. Right? Yeah, and yeah. yeah people, it's really it's, special, it's a, isn't it? And but what's it's the just response? He's older. John, what's, the re what's the response been like from the artists? Are they really pleased to have that airplay now that they may oh, not yeah. receive? Yeah. Yeah, no, they're delighted. I mean, you know, talking about Nick Kershaw, I was talking to Nick last week and he said, you know, he said, you're the only people playing my song. And I said, do you have a video? Because we're doing a TV thing as well. And he said, well, no, I didn't bother doing one because I thought no one would play it, oh. uh, which is a sad indictment, really. Talk about Nick Kershaw there. You know, you, you forget that uh, Nick Kershaw in sort of 1984 to 1986, in that sort of purple patch he was in, he actually was the biggest selling single artist in the UK. Right. Right? So I he mean, was, and then ended up doing Live Aid. He was absolutely enormous. And it does seem incredible that uh, an artist like that doesn't get played <clears throat> because they're just because they have, what, just because they happen to be older, maybe? I mean, it seems odd. It seems to be terribly, terribly selective. I mean, where Radio yeah. 2 will have a program hosted by Bruce Springsteen but won't play, who's much older than Nick Kershaw, but won't play the new Nick Kershaw or mm. the new Lamar or the new Johnny Hayes Jazz. Uh, I find that quite extraordinary yeah. how you can be very selective like that. It's, it's yeah. beyond yeah. me, really. Yeah. Neil, how does it feel to be back on the chart show? It must must be great to be able to do the countdown like you used to. You know, it, it is. I, re I mean, look, I really enjoy doing countdowns. You know, we, we created a sort of sound with the Pepsi yeah. chart that sort of changed sort of how charts were done in a way because before that they had been done at 39 at 38 at 37 they literally were a countdown with a number in between if we were going to try and they had five times as many listeners as the commercial radio chart when we started so if we were going to do something we had to try and do something different uh and so we sort of did right we're going to do fun gags talk to the artists competitions yeah. you know yeah. and we'll have 40 songs in an order and and so that started a different sound and we've sort of do it that's what we're doing now yeah. with the heritage chart that same style it it's like an entertaining radio show but we end up at number one hopefully yeah. you know and i think you know people say charts aren't very relevant now but i think a lot of that is just because the main what i call the, the mainstream radio stations aren't don't sell them as important mm. i'll tell you what to yeah. our listeners that chart's really important because yeah. they're excited to listen so that doesn't change so yeah. i think 
suddenly, but there, there, was, there was nothing in a way for people to listen to. They'd listen to the current chart and go, there's nothing in there I know. There's no one I know in that. And the songs do all sound very similar to each other. I have to say, they genuinely do. And of course, you listen to the chart now and suddenly you've got songs again and you've got, you know, I hate to say melody because that makes me sound old, but they do sound like they've got songs, tunes, choruses, riffs, you know, and they sound yeah. very different. Those 30 songs really sound different to each other. Yeah. And I think yeah. that reminds me of charts a long time ago. And that reminds yeah. me of what music really should be. And Tuning into the FM stations, um, you get the same songs played over and over again. So to hear new material from all the artists that we grew up with, it's mm. really special. We're also excited about your new TV show. Um, that was then This Is Now, Mike. Um, how's, how's that going, the lead up to that? You've been filming, haven't you? Yeah, we filmed a couple of weeks ago. When we started the Heritage Chart, uh, Mike Stock, who I've worked with on various things over the years, uh, Mike said, you know, we're looking at doing something like this on TV. Uh, so we went down, we had a chat and uh, came up with a, a title that was then This Is Now. Uh, as, again, it's a shop winner for Heritage Artists. So we filmed a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we've got a good lineup. We've got Johnny Hayes Jazz. We've got The Vapors. We've got Paul Young, uh, Kim Wilde, Marty Wilde, Lee John, uh, oh, Chesney yeah. Hawks. Uh, yeah, so... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, a really, really, really good lineup. The look oh. is terrific. It looks like Top of the Pops. We've got great dancers, great choreography. The lighting is good. The sound is fabulous. You know, it's yeah. real Top of the Pops standard. Um, We're looking forward to that. Yeah. yeah. Right. So we spoke to Clark Dachter in the week. He, he actually called you the Encyclopedia of Music, Mike. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he said he loved the, the whole idea and he couldn't wait for it to be aired. When When... We're out of the COVID situation. Do you think the show will be filmed with an audience, perhaps? Yeah, I mean, it'd be great to have an audience. I mean, obviously we couldn't for this, but we had uh, a massive space and we had a big, big crew. So there was an enormous round of applause at the end to make the artist feel yeah. there's somebody there. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we're looking to maybe kick off on November the 5th, just a few things to iron out. Uh, and really, it's a new uh, business model, really, because it, it, you'll be able to download it I think that's going to be the thing. Uh, right. And then watch it again and again and again. So it'll go out at seven o'clock on a Thursday night, the top of the pop Brilliant. slot. Uh, oh, you pay $9.99 to download it uh, and you can watch it again and again and again, this top of the pops. And the reason for this is uh, that, uh, that the profits go to the artists. Because this year the artists have made nothing. They say all the old stuff they put out on, on BBC and what have you, we don't get any money for it. And we thought, well, we'll do something where the artists can, can earn and have a profit share of the show, so it's a very new business model. It's oh, really it's... affected them this year, hasn't it, Mike? With the lockdown, it's been uh, devastating for the for the industry. It's been terrible. Everyone's done Zoom things. It's nice doing Zoom things. It's not exactly the same, and you're not really making that much money from it. No. Uh, so live gigs have gone out of the window, and of course, because of no live gigs, it will affect uh, performing rights society money. So songwriters will be really, really seriously affected next year. Having been affected on live gigs this year, they'll be affected uh, on their songwriting next year, which is a tragedy. I mean, mm. you know, and, and to have it suggested uh, that people in our industry retrain as something else is just beyond belief. Mike, we, we've met you a couple of times at the Rewind Festival and you had your Radio One Road show on, so we, we saw you in the press tent there. Um, would either of you two like to take United DJs on the road, like a road show or a festival? Well, he may be on the street. I don't know about on the road. Um, yeah. But, but yeah, I mean, I love road shows. I'm a road show animal. I used mm. to use up producers and wear them out. And they go, oh, no, at the end of the week, take me away, take me away. Uh, so, no, I, I love it. I, Foxy likes being out on the road as well, didn't you? Yeah, no, I love it. I, I, I've... Um... We, we used to do some massive gigs when we were at Capital. We take the roadshow out a lot, but actually we ended up doing sort of big gigs like Party in the Park and what have you, sort of to 100,000 or something. Yeah. And it was crazy. But yeah. I mean, the, I remember as a kid going out to some of the uh, Radio 1 roadshows when they used to go around to obviously sort of the, the holiday resorts in Britain. And I remember seeing at Fistful Beach, we went to see the Radio 1 roadshow, uh, you know, and there were sort of like 50,000 kids. It was brilliant, you know, yeah. great fun. Yeah. It should be. I mean, like, you can imagine to a certain extent taking something like that was then, this is now, would make a brilliant road show to go out on tour you know maybe yeah. with uh, you know half a dozen artists they do an old song a new song and you play some games in between and make a really fantastic road show so 
But uh, it, I know, you know, well, Mike, well, and, you... Mike and Mike have probably thought about that, but it would be good. It'd just be good yeah. for any of us to be able to get outside. I, I feel for the artists. I mean, for them, I'd love that just the chance for them to go out and earn some money, mm. you know, just to play some gigs again, uh, whether it's big or small, just so we can get out and see live music is really important because that's actually where it sounds. It's uh, Mike, we see on Twitter that you've got a close relationship with one of the much loved stars of the 70s and 80s that we grew up with. That cheeky Mr. Basil Brush. Oh, yeah, Baz, yes. Baz and I are, are close, but we are just good friends. <laughs> yeah. Can you enlighten us as to what the Pokey Polar Lunch is with Basil Brush, please, Mike? <laughs> we saw that on Twitter. <laughs> oh, yes. Well, well, Baz and I do get together now and again. We, did, um, we were in pantomime together for two years running, so I had four months of, um, of Basil, and, uh, yeah, we had great fun. We uh, do little videos in the dressing room and uh, a lot of fun on stage as well. I mean, there lots of uh, lots of larking about. I mean, it's uh, yeah, it's yeah. great. No, no, uh, yeah, Baz and I. We did um, a Christmas single a couple of years ago. We did White Christmas, so uh, oh. I put all that together. We did oh, that. I that. <laughs> oh yeah, check it out on YouTube. Check it out, Basil Brush yeah. White Christmas. I'll look that one up. Originally, this is the only reason Mike actually wanted Basil Brush to do the heritage chart, but uh, Basil wasn't obviously available, so he got uh, another one. Another... You seem to have a fascination with foxes, Mike, because you've got Neil <laughs> Fox, Basil Brush. Any plans with Sam Fox? Or uh, I can't, I can't go into that right here. Um, no, I, I'm not sure that Sam Fox would have any plans for me, to be honest. Um, but there we are. Um, there, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Yes, we've got a whole, uh, a whole. Um, Family, a, a lupine family here, which is brilliant. Um, yes, it is. The yes, I think I think brush and fox would go down well. Um, Very nice. Um, yeah, but I've been working on a few things with with Basil that we've been kicking off. So, I mean, the thing is, I end up talking like Basil, Mister Mike. I say, <laughs> love and it. And Basil says, "Wait, if I become ill, Mister Mike, could you take over?" Uh, so, yeah. Oh, I love that, Mike. I think you should definitely. I think you should definitely pop up on the heritage chart here and there. Yes, don't you? yeah, definitely gets our vote. Yes, yeah. move over, Mister Neil. Let me do number seventeen. Yes, <laughs> wonderful. I love it. Neil, um, go, just going back to your pop idol days, which act do you think, or are you most proud of? Um, well, I spent. Well, I, I was. Uh, I thought Will Young was a really worthy winner uh, and a really lovely bloke. Um, because it also he was an interesting character because he didn't want to do things necessarily the Simon Cowell way. He had his own idea about what he wanted to do, which caused some friction, I know, but it ended up being successful yeah. for him. I was really chuffed in a way on a personal level for little Gareth Gates, because you remember he was only 16 when he went through that. Oh, yeah. But he had that dreadful stammer, which what was interesting was none of us could understand why... We thought he was putting it on. How could anyone stammer so badly when you chat and then suddenly you can sing beautifully? We couldn't I know, it's that, but, So whenever he used to come in and do um, interviews for the chart, he'd have to have a, a, um, a speech coach with him. But what they would do, it's incredible how the brain works. They'd get him to talk in rhythms. And when oh. you talk in rhythms, it helps him overcome <laughs> the problems of um, stammering. Yeah. And if you spoke to him now, you'd have you wouldn't think the guy had any time. He's he's learned to overcome it, which is probably a huge for him. It was brilliant as a young man, but probably for an awful lot of other kids and people out there who also had that problem. They suddenly looked at this kid on telly um, who looked like an angel, had a voice like an angel. But when he talked, he was having so much of a trouble. And so I thought that was a really nice story to come out of it. He was, I mean, again, a lovely fella. There were some yeah. nice people that came through that. It was. You know, we had yeah, it must have been great it. to be there at that time because I think that he was an inspiration to everyone watching, really. So, um, well, you think between was... them, they had eight number ones in that first year between them. It, it did dominate. I mean, it did become a bit yeah. crazy. I know. Oh, good good fun. Fun. <laughs> and Mike, uh, you've penned lots of songs for some of the big artists like um, Steve Harley, Cliff Richard, the Bee Gees, Mark Armand. Can you give us some examples of some of the songs you've written? Because it's not widely sort of known. Yeah, I've always loved songwriting. I've written since I was a kid. Um, it, it's a great thrill when somebody whose records you bought when you were a kid actually is singing your song and you're in the studio. I mean, uh, but no, I enjoy writing. I enjoy uh, either writing by myself or collaborating. Writing for my stage musicals is great because you're not thinking pop. You've got a broad palette. Who's proud of, Mike? Uh, Neil, Neil Sedaka once said to me when I asked Neil that question, 
He said, Mike, they're all my little babies. I send them into the world and they send me money home. And I thought, <laughs> that's a, I, I wouldn't answer it exactly the same way, but yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, they're all, I think the first hit you probably have, you know, Van and David Essex was in the charts for two months and uh, was a hit in Australia as well. So the, you're quite proud of that. I suppose yeah. it's your sort of firstborn in a way uh, in terms of chart hits. You know, the highest was number four. Oh, wow. uh, and I had a lot of great artists on, you know, Steve Winwood, Brian Wilson uh, and co. And it's, it's very strange, isn't it? Very odd. And during lockdown, of course, it's been a great time for writing. I've, I'm just uh, doing a song with Graham Goldman at the moment. I've been writing with uh, big American writer Phil Springer. I've been writing with Warren Bennett. Might be doing something with Peter Donegan. So, yeah, it's been a good time for writers. Oh, to, yeah. uh, and you've got a love for poetry, haven't you, Mike? Um, the First World War Poets, uh, Rupert Brooke, that you've written. Yeah, I did. About. Yeah, I did a book on on Brooke and founded the uh, the museum at Cambridge. Uh, wow. We worked on his stuff out of modern archives there. And yeah, I mean, I, I I set his war sonnets to music, recorded those with Eton College Choir and with the King's College Choir, uh, wow. which is a great thrill to sit there and listen to them doing your stuff in the in in the chapel. I mean, wonderful. I, I mean, it's good because you're taking you're taking that poetry to kids who think, oh, poetry is boring. Hang on, it's a pop song. Uh, so you're taking it to a new generation. Finally, I mean, we've got so many questions we could ask, but we just wonder if we could do a quick fire 80s question round, if that's all right. First one is best song of the 80s, in your opinion? Band-Aid. They know it's Christmas. Because it, cha it changed music, right? No one had ever done something like that. And then you had Live Aid following it and suddenly charity records and suddenly music had power, had political yeah. power. And it was a brilliant yeah. song. It was a great song at the Definitely. end of the day as well. Brilliant. And what a lineup. Yeah. Look at that awesome. lineup on that. Oh, what a lineup. Yeah, incredible. The ones that are still alive are still making great music nowadays. Amazing. Yeah. That's right. Mike? Mike? Yeah, I, I, I agree with Neil on that. It's, it's now emotional when you look at that. And, the, and it pans across the sea of faces, some with us, some not with us. And yeah. when it pans across that sea of faces, I, the other day I watched it, I thought, oh, I, I don't remember feeling emotional about that before. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to pick uh, a song that uh, wasn't a big hit at all. I'm going to pick um, Hollow Horse by the Icicle Works. Right. That was a great band, wasn't it? The Icicle Works. Yeah. 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 McNabb's yeah. still writing some good songs. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, what's the best album for you both for the, for the 80s? If you could pick one album, a definitive album. I know it's going to be a, a difficult one. <laughs> Well, these are pretty tough questions. You're starting yeah. off with really tough ones, girls. I've got to be honest. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, uh, well, for me, I'll have to pick one that I that I just played an awful lot. Um, I, I'm going to go for Appetite for Destruction, Guns N' Roses. <laughs> really random. Oh, yeah, there were so yeah, many yeah. brilliant albums. They really were. So many George Michael things yeah. you could have done. But actually, just yeah. I, I just remember at that time, there were lots of reasons why, but uh, that was an um, amazing album that stood the test of time yeah brilliant and that won't be mike reed's choice <laughs> <laughs> over to you mike <laughs> well i i'm gonna pick my john betjeman album because it's full of my songs uh and i don't care and no one else is gonna pick it so i will uh and it's full of loads and loads of different great artists so hurrah that's my choice hey, hey brilliant <laughs> what would you go for agadu or the birdie song well, agadu for me uh, yeah, Agadu, Agadu, cool. every time. God, we've gone from the sublime to the ridiculous yeah, on that one. Yeah, that but, right. Quite literally. <laughs> You've both had such amazing careers in the music industry, but what for you was the happiest time of your career, if you can pick one? So far. One. I think for me, it was being selected to read the... I mean... As you're, growing up as a kid, you see the BBC is this amazing organisation and Radio One and Top of the Pops and what have you. Uh, and for the BBC Diamond Jubilee, I was picked along with Richard Baker to read in St Paul's Cathedral. Oh, wow. And I, I walked up the aisle behind the Archbishop of Canterbury, Robert Runcie, uh, went off to my lectern and I could see rows of faces of famous, famous people I'd known when I was a kid. Uh, and it was packed and it was going out around the world. It was being broadcast around the world. Wow. And I, 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 you know, I stood there and a yard in front of me is a queen, a Prince Philip, the royal family, and just everyone. I thought, this is an amazing moment. I mean, you wow. know, one of, the, one of the biggest capitals in the world in London. I'm doing it for the BBC. It's the Diamond Jubilee. It's, it's a, an incredible organisation. 
Um, wow. In St Paul's, which has got a phenomenal history, the royal family and all these great people are here. I thought, this is really something else. I think it was the only time I was really nervous. Oh, and wow. I saw that I saw that my piece in the Bible extending like that. And I thought, <laughs> no, 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 shrink, shrink, shrink. And uh, I, I thought I was I was seriously looking at it, wondering how I could cut words out. And I thought, no, I'm not sure. I'm not sure the Almighty would like that if I started chopping bits of the Bible apart. But um, yeah, that oh, was uh, oh, that was certainly that a moment. An amazing yeah. memory, Mike. Thank you for sharing that. What wow. about yourself, uh, Neil? What what's what stands out for you? Uh, Gosh, um, it's, I guess in many respects, it's, uh, it's some of the big live events we did um, because we'd ended up taking a, a, a local radio station, Capital Radio, which was a very big local radio station, but it was a big, yeah. you know, it's a London radio station, right? And we'd sort of ended up doing this big gig one day and we were doing, um, I suppose it was one of the ones, when we, the early days of doing Party in the Park when we did it with the Prince's Trust and we had the most stellar lineup. And, you know, I yeah. remember sort of talking with my bosses and a couple of my colleagues who we were sort of standing at the edge of the stage. There were 100,000 people out there. The sun was shining. A most Amazing. unbelievable oh. lineup of enormous artists. Prince Charles yeah. is wandering around the back. And you're kind of going, this is huge. And you could just feel the excitement, the build up in the week. Okay. It was just yeah. great to be part yeah. of it, to be able to step out on stage and just go, and actually have 100,000 people singing yeah. Doctor Doctor Jingle. Yeah. But, you know, is that feeling of a crowd yeah. all having an amazing time. You could say, what's your best motto or philosophy of life? Uh, mine's always been seize the day. That's why I call my autobiography. I was going to call it Carpe Diem. And my publisher said, no, your listeners won't understand that. Call it seize the day. So I did. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, and for me, actually, weirdly, um, it definitely it's been a motto that's, sort of uh, grown and grown, particularly over the last few years of being through some tough times, it's been, uh, if I had to teach my kids anything, it'd be better, not bitter. Oh, right. that's, that's a great one. Mm. Brilliant. Oh, thank you so much both.